Welcome everybody to today's Consortium of Universities for Global Health webinar, COVID-19, Socioeconomic and Racial Disparities in the United States and how we can address them. I'm Dr. Keith Martin, the Executive Director of CUGH. We know that COVID-19 has been devastating worldwide. In the United States, it's claimed over 80,000 lives, but nowhere has it been more devastating than in minority communities, in African-Americans, Latinos, First Nations. And this tragedy has shone a bright light on deep structural inequalities that have existed in the United States for a very long time. Access to healthcare, education, housing, and others. And communities of uh, minority communities and low-income communities who would have to live in areas that were subjected to industrial pollution. These structural inequalities have caused a lack of access to the social determinants of health, a lack of equality to opportunity. Today, we have four outstanding leaders from various parts of the United States who are going to share with us the impact of COVID-19 on these communities and how we can address these structural inequalities that have hamstrung the, the potential of so many people in this country for so long. Our first speaker is Dr. Maika Smart. Dr. Smart is an assistant professor and the director of leadership in medicine for the underserved at Michigan State University. Dr. Maureen Lichtfeld is a professor and is the chair of environmental health sciences at Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine in New Orleans. And Dr. Lichtfeld will be followed by Dr. Patricia Davidson. Dr. Davidson is the Dean of Nursing and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And finally, after Dr. Davidson, Dr. Mark Hausfeld, who is the Director of Global Health Programs and Associate Dean Emeritus at the University of New Mexico, will be the last speaker. So it's my great privilege to hand it over to Dr. Smart. Dr. Smart, over to you. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm Maika Smart, like you said, Director of Leadership in Medicine for the Underserved, and we are located in Flint, Michigan. So I'd like to start off by just giving you an opportunity to see what uh, life was like in Flint at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, this is a video that was taken by my husband. He was out, he is an administrator at a local school system here and he was out delivering lunches to families and people in his school. He's saying right now, I know you can't hear him, this is five blocks of cars of people waiting for water. That line for water was a two hour line. That was what life was like in Flint at the beginning of the coronavirus. I'm gonna move on to the next slide to let you know that myself and a couple of colleagues did a random sample of 70 food outlets that have been able to remain open while we are under lockdown here in the state of Michigan. And right now, uh, employees are not, uh, they're not enforcing social distancing. Many patrons, many employees and stores are not wearing masks. And so one of the biggest outcomes we thought of this research that we did in early May was gonna be that we were gonna encourage the store owners to go ahead and encourage people to wear masks upon entering the stores. However, even that has proven to be uh, not so effective because we we can't. Uh, people's lives are in danger. I don't know if you've heard this, but there was a security guard employed by a family dollar right in the middle of Flint, and that uh, security guard kindly asked a patron of the store to put the mask on a child that had come into the store with their parents and was shot and killed as a result. We have reports from all over the state of similar really aggressive incidents happening from employees in stores asking for folks to just put masks on. So that's a very kind of, a, it's a summary of, of some of the things that are happening with coronavirus here in Flint. I'm gonna move over to another issue because the, the reason for the talk today is health disparities in the United States. So I'm gonna talk about a specific health disparity right here in this area. This is a, a chart of infant death rates and you can see that we're here in the Flint area and at the bottom, there's the infant death rate per thousand infants per Caucasians in the area. Then in the middle, that's the kind of total for everybody. 
And then above that, the line for African Americans. And simply put, this means that in Flint, Black babies die more. That's what this means. I'm zooming out now. So this is no longer the specifically the area of Flint. This is all of Michigan together. And so on the bottom line, you can see in green, that's the line for Michigan, the infant death rate. And then right above it, you see Genesee County. And that is the county that the city of Flint is located in. And then above it, you can see the line for infant death rates for the city of Flint. Now you might remember that in the city of Flint, African-Americans were higher than Caucasians and higher than the total overall. So if the top line on this slide is the total overall, that means there's another a visible line that's not there, but is there in reality where black babies are dying more than anybody here in this area. And so the question of the day and that we're asking you to think about internationally is why, why is that? And a publication that we that it comes out here in Flint that's done by the three hospital systems that come together to do the community, uh, community needs assessment gives answers. And so this is one of the answers that's given in the publication that there are things that have large impact and small impact. And you can see the stuff that has the largest impact at the bottom there. And at the bottom, things that have the largest impact are poverty, education, housing, and inequality. Now, what I wanna encourage you to think about is whether poverty, education, housing, and inequality are indeed real causes. They're not real factors. Poverty is caused by something. Poor education is caused by something. Inadequate housing has a cause. So these, the, the, what's written here, these can't be the reasons. Socioeconomic factors, that's not good enough. There's something else at the root of why these socioeconomic factors persist to create ongoing inequality. And I think that what needs to happen is we have to confront root causes and that's part of why we're having this conversation today. Um, I want to share some slides that do not belong to me. These belong to the gentleman whose name is in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. His name is Mo Barbosa, and it's a tragedy that he's not presenting today, and it's me, because his slides are outstanding. Um, so three, three observations that he makes about racial inequalities in America. One is that racial inequity looks the same across systems, and we're talking education, health, all, type, all types of systems, socioeconomic differences do not explain the racial inequity. And so that just means that even if you were to look and see whether there were more wealthy Black Americans and compare them to white Americans, we're still not doing well. Inequities are caused by systems regardless of people's culture or behavior and that our racially structured society is what causes racial inequity. Getting back to COVID-19, right now, Black and Latino workers are overrepresented among the essential, we're overrepresented among the unemployed, and therefore overrepresented among the dead. And part of the reasons, a big part of the reason is li living conditions. Um, there's a uh, new publications that was just released yesterday, I believe, or, or two days ago, uh, written by Lisa Cooper, co-authored by Lisa Cooper, and uh, there's another author, and they talk about how there's this new concept that we have to think about around herd immunity and why some living conditions are causing COVID mortality to be excessive in specific areas. The reasons include densely populated areas, residential segregation, being further away to grocery stores and having to go to those stores that are outside of their immediate area, medical facilities being further away, multi-generational households so that young folks and older folks with the older folks being at risk still are in homes with young people that are um, taking this a little bit more lightly and going in and out. And then we're overrepresented in jails, prisons and detention centers. Thank you for listening. I'm going to hand it over now to Maureen.
Thank you, Maika. And um, for me, you'll hear um, somewhat of the same, but through the lens of a special city, uh, my special city, New Orleans. Uh, as you could see from my title slide, we lost three icons um, through COVID-19. Um, one, uh, a, leadership, a leader in the Zulu um, club, and that's one of our um, Mardi Gras crews, a leader in the Mardi Gras Indian, and um, community and virtually everybody in the world knows Alice Marsalis as one of our um, leaders in music. So here are some of the, um, the, the titles that we saw, the headlines that we saw um, that are um, maybe shocking to some people now. They're not shocking to us anymore. They're just being made visible again. So if we look at the risk burden in minorities, there are three within uh, in our Gulf South, including um, New Orleans, historic and intransigent health disparities, residents in disaster prone areas, and yes, in a couple of weeks, June 1, the hurricane season starts again, and then persistent environmental health threats. And I'll um, go over each of those three. Within that and embedded in this triple risk burden um, is that unique COVID-19 vulnerability. I'm taking you back to Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and this was the only way um, communities could, co could communicate who was still alive and who needed to be rescued um, after the levees gave away. And as you can see, in some communities, that's the only Christmas present um, that they wanted, new levies. But if you look closer um, on the right-hand side of the home, you'll see um, a, a cross, a David cross, and that gives actually the indication of how many people were found, how many people were dead, and how many animals died. Also, you see those little black spots, and those black spots are not spots from paint, um, they're mold spots. And this is one of the studies um, that I did, that one of the first ones I did when I um, joined Tulane University is looking at um, the um, impact on uh, kids with asthma, with the diagnosed mother to severe asthma who lived in these homes. And in addition to, yes, finding a number of mold spores, we also were able to show that children who lost a pet and children who had to change schools more than twice a year were more vulnerable to asthma attacks, showing clearly the psychosocial impact of disasters, including of COVID-19. If we look across the state, um, COVID-19 cases, you could see that the, the larger the yellow dots, the greater the number of cases. And again, you see the vulnerability of New Orleans. Not many people know about Cancer Alley. Cancer Alley is an area of more than 100 facilities where people live, um, where people live where there are um, cancer cases that are higher, much higher than the state and much higher than the national average. It is difficult though um, to show, and here are some of the data, it is really difficult to make a connection between what we call in environmental health and ex a completed exposure pathway between cancer cases and environmental exposures. Cancer Alley is an area between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, where we have, as I mentioned before, over 140 chemical um, factories um, and oil refineries. But you can see the data, um, uh, both for uh, the percentage below federal, the federal poverty level, as well as the median income. As part of environmental health, climate and climate and health and climate change is not just a threat where we live, it is real. Not only are we sinking, we also had, and what um, the United Homa Nation does not want to call refugees, but we had, we are the first community where, and this is Ile de St. Charles, where people had to move, not only because climate and the change of climate, but also because environmental dredging, 
simply because of pollution, they were no longer able to live where they wanted to live. Um, it is more than time for us to stop seeing health, depending where you live, it determines your health. And so um, some social determinants, here you see the median income um, from New Orleans specifically, you see the number percentage um, of people who are obese with high school graduation. In other words, we have a very health disparate population where we live. And it is on top of that, that we will see the impact of COVID-19. Here you see the differences between black and white in terms of the prevalence of chronic conditions. And for each condition, um, blacks are, the, those conditions are more prevalent in blacks compared to white. Um, racial inequities, pay attention to those red spots. Look at New Orleans, Albany, Georgia, Baltimore, and Detroit. Those are exactly the same cities where we also now have disproportionate numbers of cases and deaths in African-Americans. So why is this happening? We have a higher rate in comor of comorbidities in uh, minority groups, higher rate of multi-generational household units. Um, as you heard before from the previous speaker, um, in New Orleans, first the testing sites were drive through only. If you don't have a car, you can then not get tested. And then later walk-in sites were, um, were added. And so if we look at inequality and inequity in mortalities and blacks by state, you see that in every state, beginning with Louisiana, we see a 24 point difference between um, uh, blacks mortality versus um, white mortality. And you could see whether it's Georgia, Alabama, New York, Texas, or California, you see that difference. And so if we particularly look at the risk that using those data um, of COVID-19 for Blacks compared to white, African-Americans compared to Caucasians, if, if white is one in terms of a risk level, you see the more than doubling in Louisiana, and you could see that number again holding for every state that we reviewed. Um, we haven't heard much about um, Hispanics um, because the data are simply not being collected. But as, again, as you can see, in every state, there is a higher percentage of um, Hispanics dying um, from COVID-19. It is a specific to Louisiana and comorbidities in COVID-19 deaths. Um, and again, you see hypertension, diabetes, um, chronic kidney disease, and cardiac uh, cardiac disease leading um, those comorbidities. Let's look at the social and economic side of the ledger. Unemployment, 105,000 um, people were filed on unemployment claims in the first three weeks of the pandemic. If you look at the graph, you see the unemployment spiking after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, then came the Great Recession in 2008, then the all spill in 2010, and look at 2020 and the unemployment because of COVID-19. It tops all of those other previous disasters. Now, who's able to work from home? It's easier said than done. Yes, we should do social distancing, but clearly African-Americans and Latinos are at a disadvantage when it comes to the ability to work at home. Now, here is public health at work. For some, but not all. Clearly, as, as we started with stay at home order, the cases went down, but the cases can go down for everyone because if you work in, high risk, in a high risk industry and you need to be employed, you just can't stay home. So um, some solutions from a policy perspective, um, the governor created a health equity task force. I am hoping that that health equity task force is not only to address COVID-19, but rather, as my colleague um, just said, is to address those root causes. Um, and so those root causes have to do with what we refer to as the social capitals. So make sure that everyone has the right to live in an environmentally safe place, that everyone has the right to have grocery stores um, with healthy food close to them, a right and the opportunity to work, 
to preserve its culture. And for New Orleans, culture is critically important to make sure we have strong social networks despite social distancing and that our political leadership is actually supportive to protect us. So I want to leave you showing you the strength of our culture and the strength of our social coherence. We still celebrate birthdays, but we celebrate birthdays now by driving by and honking. Thank you. So turning it over now to Dean Patricia Davidson. Thank you. So thank you so much uh, to Dr. Smart and Dr. Lickfield um, in presenting the reality of what's facing minority populations now in the United States. So really when we look at um, social determinants of health, whether you live in Baltimore or Bangalore, the factors contributing to health disparities are pretty much the same. Poverty, marginalization, isolationism, and environmental and geopolitical instability. Sorry, my slides are not advancing. So um, as you can see here, um, as uh, Dr. Lickfield uh, identified, Baltimore is one of the hot spots in terms of health disparities in the United States. But this is not universal around the city. And we see in some areas of the city up to a 20 years in health disparities. And it's, it's hard to believe that this is just in the, in the midst of just a couple of street blocks. Sometimes you see these marginal differences. So it really makes us think that we can do a whole lot better. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, I guess, the power of data and what we need to take from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, my previous speakers have eloquently identified what the real issues are, but how are we going to move forward? And I think one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has clearly op laid open the fissures in society. And if we can follow these data, and if we can learn from these data, I hope that we can move forward to decrease health disparities. Also, I think one of the things, um, I, just on these last two slides, you will have recognized the Hopkins maps, but more importantly, going beyond just um, the numbers at a macro level, we need to really drill down into looking at um, characteristics of of the population in terms of race and ethnicity, health insurance, and the availability of healthcare services. So I think this is a time where public health has really increased in importance and thinking about running acute care health services without thinking about your community and population is at your peril. Um, I also uh, just wanted to put this in as well. This is a slide from State of the World's Nursing Report. I know that many of the people on the call are from all around the world. I just want to recommend to you that for every country, um, there is a report card on nursing in your particular um, country. And also some other important data that can help plan for robust and resilient healthcare systems. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my reflections on the COVID-19 pandemic. And some of those reflections are quite visceral. And because I think each and every one of us thinks, how did we get there? And so as I've looked at my own local environment and communicated colleagues all around the world, I think one of the fundamental flaws that we've had in thinking about healthcare is we have not considered it in terms of an ecosystem. And also we cannot deny in the context of COVID-19, the highly politicized aspect of health. And for any of you listening to the Senate hearings today in the United States, you'll recognize that we need to, to be aware of the political context in which we provide healthcare. So we have to think about healthcare at the level of society, at the level of our organisations and communities, and also some of the individual factors that can contribute to health and wellbeing. And I really like the fact that our previous speakers have spoken about the role of culture and community, because these factors are critically important. 
Of course, really, this is where the sustainable development goals have been trying to move us towards. And although many of us, particularly in the acute care health environment, think about just goal number three as good health, that's all we need to follow. But as you can see here from the 17 goals, we need to address each and every one of these factors in order to obtain health and economic prosperity. And I guess in these times, we've seen some fundamental uh, injustices, particularly also in terms of access to healthcare services and access to the law because of people's residency status. And I think that is another important factor. And it leads us to think that many of the deaths have likely been underreported because people are fearful of interacting with the healthcare system in the United States and other countries because of their residency status. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do at Johns Hopkins and I know that many other institutions are doing similar issues to think of the role of the university in the context of health and communities and I think this speaks very much to the agenda of CUGH where we recognise that universities have a really powerful force in communities not just in terms of education, but thought leadership and leveraging social change. So this I'm um, just identifying is a different conceptual framework to academic health sciences centres. When I first started working in healthcare, it was all about the hospital, but we did not think, and we, even though we recognised clinical care research and teaching as important, we had much less engagement in terms of community and policy. And so from the previous speakers, you've seen some very powerful and compelling data, which means that we have to think differently and we have to get policymakers to think differently about healthcare and how we fund health and social services. So just one of the um, key activities that we are doing in Hopkins is um, a Hopkins Local Initiative, which is very much sponsored by the president of the university. And so there's a dedicated commitment to using the local community, buying locally, hiring locally, and building locally. And I, one of the greater concerns that I have, as many of you share, is the skyrocketing unemployment. And Baltimore is not a city that can really take too many more insults. But we know that these initiatives to support the local community are going to be more and more critical because not only does work put food on the table, it also fuels self-esteem and social stability. Unfortunately, we would like to think in a city like Baltimore that COVID-19 would result in people staying at home and not engaging in other activities. But sadly, our homicide rate is just the same, one of the highest in the nation. And the opioid epidemic lives on strong in Baltimore. So we're really trying to engage in a range of activities that look at the social determinants of health. So just two blocks from the Johns Hopkins Hospital in one of those areas where it's identified that there uh, is a 20 year life expectancy differential. We have Henderson Hopkins School. And I love this photo because whenever I feel a dark day, I look at this above my desk and see it. Here is Dr. Sharps and here are the children of East Baltimore in a school which is the first school built in East Baltimore in over 20 years. And it's by these strategies where we support, enable and empower communities that we're really going to make a difference from the future. Also, I just wanted to give some feedback from the World Health Organization. Uh, we are the secretariat for the Collaborating Centers for Nursing and Midwifery. And what we see is really some interesting changes where we are learning from the global south. Countries such as Rwanda have mobilized really effectively to address the threats of COVID-19. So I think as we look at a global community, if we look at strategies to not only contain the spread of COVID-19, we have to look from around the world for lessons that help us build resilient and robust communities. 
The other thing that I have been thinking about, and I must admit, as in days gone by, if I was at a committee meeting and someone spoke to me about supply chain, I would probably yawn and think it was very boring. But now, can I tell you, nearly every day is supply chain is all I think about. Because we know, because of the lack of access to personal protective equipment, many people have died. And as also many healthcare workers have died. So as we look at health and human rights, I think we really need to look at the intersection between business and healthcare. We also see that the advancement of science is, all, is also complicated by business interests. And what the key lesson that we've learned in countries like the United States, which is one of the richest country in the world where many scientific advances have come from, that this segregated, disparate aggregation of healthcare facilities based on profit and on a business model are doing nothing to sustain the healthcare of the nation. And every day, as I look at the death toll mounting from COVID-19 in the United States, I feel we can do better and we have to ensure that for generations to come, this never happens again. So thank you so much to Dr. Martin and CUGH for sponsoring this webinar. I think it's really important to think about the factors that contribute to health disparities, but I'd also like for all of us to think about how can we recover from this? How can we build and sustain communities? And how do we move to an integrated model of global health, where there is collaboration, where there are integrated supply chains, where there is sharing of knowledge, and each and every one of us is committed to the well-being of citizens all around the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is Mark Asphalt, and this is something completely different. This is actually the shipwreck. This is right outside of the hospital that I occasionally work at. I'm going to talk about about the impact of COVID on Native Americans. Um, as you can see by my title, I'm not only a professor of emergency medicine at the University of New Mexico, I also work part-time at the Northern Navajo Medical Center in Shiprock. And I've been working for the Indian Health Service kind of intermittently for the last 30 years. So Native Americans suffer from many of the problems of social um, and health that we've discussed before. It's a population that tends to be quite poor, unemployment rates are very high, and chronic illnesses, and particularly diabetes, cardiovascular, renal disease, liver disease, are very common. The life expectancy is much shorter than the US average. Depends a lot on which tribe, but in general, it's five to six years shorter than average. There's also a problem with substance abuse and trauma, both interpersonal and more of the trauma is probably non-interpersonal motor vehicle accidents are much higher. But Native Americans have unique healthcare advantages that um, no other minority group, in fact, the majority group in the United States doesn't really have. And the US government has taken some responsibility for Native American healthcare back in the 1700s. And since 1954, the Indian Health Service has been chartered by Congress to deliver essentially the same level of health care to the tribes, to tribal members, as is enjoyed by the general population. In 1975, um, law was passed that devolved control of the Indian Health Service facilities to the tribes. Not all tribes have taken advantage of this, but most have, and most of the facilities are now managed by tribal members. So overall, essentially all Native Americans are covered by the Indian Health Service. On top of that, about 80% are covered by something else, Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance. The Indian Health Service is very widespread. There are about 92 clinics, there are 24 hospitals, it's in 35 states. It covers about 2 million Natives and there are about 500 plus federally chartered tribes. Not all of these have hospitals immediately available to them. Funding is about 
one billion dollars as noted, but it's also funded by CMS funds, the Medicare Medicaid funds, and the tribes can collect insurance. So much of the expense for Indian health care is actually non-budget. On top of that, a lot of the care is not done within the system, but is referred out. Specialty care in particular is often referred out to the nearest major medical center. And of course, for natives who don't live on a reservation, a lot of that care is self-directed. If you have insurance, you would just go to the nearest place to accept your insurance. There's about $8 billion in COVID funding, which has been given to the tribes in the last few weeks. The Navajo Nation just got an $8 million grant delivered to them three days ago. But there is a chronic shortage of providers. And in particular, there's, there's a shortage of high level providers, not a lot of specialty physicians, a shortage of physicians overall, and a shortage of nursing and ancillary support. <laughs> but I need to say that natives are not the same and the tribes are quite different. And you have to look at this as a, a unification with considerable diversity. Some of the Pueblos are actually abandoned or used only for ceremonies. Maybe two or three people live there. Everybody else lives nearby in a city. Some tribes are completely urban. Um, as was pointed out to me by a friend of mine, her tribe was trading with the Aztecs thousands, hundreds of years ago, um, and were a lot more sophisticated than, than my ancestors were when they were sacking Rome. And some tribes actually have quite a bit of money. But the media version is not incorrect. In general, um, the tribes have significant disadvantages. Infections in particular have been a big problem. The mortality for H1N1 is four times the US average among Native Americans. And this is thought to be primarily difficulty in getting treatment promptly. So what's COVID been doing? Well, as of this morning, there were 4,544 reported cases and 135 deaths. So the tribes in general are highly overrepresented in COVID cases and COVID deaths. The Pueblos, which are highly urbanized, very concentrated small towns, um, have been hit particularly hard. The rural ones, such as Zuni, Hopi, um, maybe Taos, are quite isolated. People live in very small communities, quite a distance from anywhere else. And when people get sick, it spreads rapidly. The more urban Pueblos have been infected from outside. And the Zia Pueblo has 850 members, 31 of them have COVID as of yesterday. The San Felipe Pueblo with only 2,000 members has 52 cases. So these are very high case numbers. I want to talk a little bit about the Navajo Nation because it's not only um, kind of prototypical of the rural Native Americans, it's also by far the biggest. It's hyper rural, it's huge. There are about a third of a million tribal members, only half of them live on the reservation. There's an enormous number of unpaved roads, which are a major cause of trauma. It's poor, 40% of the population was unemployed prior to COVID, 40% are under the poverty line, and the median household income is only $20,000. Socially, people tend to live in fairly small camps with maybe a dozen members who are related. They're multi-generational, which is a problem. Because children can bring COVID into the camp and infect the elders. Well, what happened? Well, Disco Snagazi 19, otherwise known as COVID, as of today, there were 3,245 cases and 103 deaths. The reservation was seeded by a large evangelical meeting on March 7th, before things really hit and people started clamping down. That seeded all parts of the Navajo reservation. So all parts now have now had an outbreak. And the socioeconomic status has immediately had an impact. 40% of Navajo on the reservation haul water. They have no running water available. 
So access to water for hand cleaning and sanitation is somewhat limited. On the other hand, the nation has been incredibly aggressive about public health measures. Reservations have been closed since mid-March. All the casinos were closed. All the schools were closed. Pretty much all of the businesses were closed. Self-isolation has been rigorously stressed. Gatherings have been lim limited to 10 or fewer people. Um, there has been enormous public health push through all kinds of media by the tribe. Um, people are washing their hands. You see masks available pretty much everywhere right now. They went to the state of New Mexico and the state of New Mexico closed the city of Gallup, which is the largest city, largest town really, near the reservation. All access from, from the freeway into Gallup was closed on May 1st and reopened three days ago. And the tribe has also done an amazing job of testing. 8% of Navajos on the reservation have been tested for COVID. That's four times as many as the U.S. population. Over, almost 3,000 people have been tested. 600 are positive um, in one hospital. This is the Northern Navajo Medical Center Hospital. They have 24 inpatients with COVID. They have reasonable protective gear available, probably better than the average hospital in the United States right now, but it's still somewhat limited. They have an external tent, which is doing 100% of the triage up until about eight hours ago. Um, eight hours ago, the tent blew over, but they're rebuilding it. The emergency department has one dedicated ultrasound that's only used for COVID cases. This is much more sophisticated than the care you would get in most rural hospitals. And 100% of the intubated patients on ventilators are being transferred out to tertiary care centers without any problems so far. Well, what can we do about this problem? It's not straightforward. Adding money for healthcare probably would not have a major effect. These are very rural places and they already have fairly reasonable healthcare. Health education probably would help. The federal government and the tribes are very active, all of the tribes are. What about basic health care measures though? Sewage has, met, has dramatically improved over the last few decades. 30 years ago, the majority of cases of enteric infections, serious enteric infections occurred on reservations. That's almost unheard of. I have not seen a case of, of serious enteric infections in several years. It would be better to have more water available and the tribes are working on that. Better roads would be important, but this is extraordinarily expensive. On the other hand, the democratic demographic transition has been a real problem. The reservations are food deserts. It can be a hundred miles from your camp to the nearest place where you can buy food. The tribes have been brilliant about this. The Navajo Nation has tripled the tax on junk food and eliminated taxes on all fruits and vegetables in the last two years. The population is still quite overweight, but it's improving. It turns out that among children and adolescents, there's less obesity than there is in the general population in the United States. Tribes also have huge exercise and diet programs. One of my friends runs a major running camp for Native Americans, which now has sites all over the United States. And there's been a support to bring in subsidized nutritional food. There's also support for anti-violence and anti substance abuse programs, which are a problem in rural areas in general. It's actually interesting though, the biggest single problem the tribe has been describing is that there's no communications. There's no internet in the interior of the Navajo Nation or most of the Northern tribes or among Alaska natives. So you simply can't get information out and one thing that would be incredibly helpful, I think, is having better access to cell phones, better access to the internet. And lastly, I'd like to point out that only about half of Native Americans live on a reservation. So care for them is really a different process. And more money and more effort needs to be spent in decreasing the disparity among that population. And that's all I have. This is the road leading, leaving Northern Navajo Medical Center towards the Ute Reservation. 
and that's Ute Mountain in the background. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much to all of our speakers for such wonderful presentations. And for those of you who are online right now, and we've got many people around the world, please do send in your questions in the in the question box, and uh, we'll get to as many of them as possible. The first question I, I'd actually like to pose to all of the speakers, because it's, a, it's, the, it's the existential question that Alexandra is posing, and she wants to know is um, the, that, that what can we do to use the COVID tragedy as an opportunity to make sweeping social changes economically, politically, uh, and in addressing those root causes that all of you have, have mentioned? And I'm going to start in the in the way that we started. So, if, uh, Mike, if you want to start, and Maureen, if you want to add a few points, and uh, Trish, um, and then Mark, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Smart, please go ahead. Sure. I think I'll point to, to two things that I think have really been illuminated by COVID-19 that have been problems for the United States all along. And the first is um, the concept of hierarchy. All of us know what hierarchy is conceptually, I believe. And all of us know that there are those that are above others and there are those that are below others. And the hierarchy that exists um, that causes some people to be more at risk for all types of things than others is, is made painfully clear with COVID-19. And so I think that as we have now no reason to anymore be blinded to that fact, the hierarchy causes poor health um, for those at the bottom, then uh, we should just expose those hierarchies whenever we see them and try to make them as um, equitable as possible. And the second thing is individualism. I mean, I think that maybe you guys have seen what's going on here in Michigan. There are many, many people who feel like they have the right to decide whether they want to wear a mask in public or not. They have the right to decide whether they want to reopen their stores or not. And they are marching with guns for that right. And that individualism is making all of us sick. And in places, I think somebody pointed to Rwanda, in places where uh, people can all get behind, you know, one solid idea to say, let's keep all of us healthy, all of us, this doesn't happen as much. So hierarchy and individualism, you want to um, uh, snip it out and, and make sure that you squash it whenever possible. Thank you, Dr. Smart. Uh, Dr. Lickfeld. Too long have we given lip service to um, addressing health disparities, decreasing health disparities, mitigating health disparities. Um, and that happens because we don't take a comprehensive integrated approach to that. It also happens because we think we know it best, rather the communities know it best. And so it will take a community academic partnership or governmental partnership to make those changes. It will take a consistent in, you know, investment, not a one-time investment because there is a pandemic or because there was a, a hurricane. So that persistent investment has to be um, implemented in a way that identifies and respects the assets that communities have. Yes, communities have needs. They absolutely have tremendous amount of asset and knowledge. Uh, and it's taking those assets combined with the investments to address two of the most fundamental reasons why there are health disparities. One is education and two is access to quality health care. Not just health care, but quality health care. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Davidson. So uh, I'd really like to build on what Dr. Smart and Dr. Lickfeld has said. I think, you know, what has got us here has been this trends towards individualism, nationalism, and populism, and othering. Mm -hmm. You know, in the United States, we would have been in a much better place if we had looked and listen to China, but it was seen very much as about an economic and supply chain issue. So we have to move towards uh, some mechanism of global governance. And this is what the World Health Organization has meant to many of us. But the events of COVID-19 have 
underscored that it's very difficult for them to do the work within the current global political environment. So, you know, I think COVID-19 has really just laid these fractures in our health system and our society wide open. I think maybe how do we get people to look and listen? Because for each of us, this is our life's work. These are the things that we've cared about. I think we have to have these conversations in the context of society and business. And I think there's a good number of people who are prepared to tolerate a certain amount of death and suffering in order for the economy to thrive. So I think we need to look to holding our um, politicians accountable and we really need to try and pivot to how we get some form of global governance because there's been quite marked backlash against globalization um, just not in a business sense, but in a more bro broader socio-cultural sense. And I, I just think um, COVID-19 has shown us that we, together we stand, um, divided we fall. And so every person on the planet, no matter where they are in the world, their healthcare influences someone else. And that is just something that I'm not sure how the best way, but we have to tell our children, our students, our colleagues, and our politicians. Indeed, and uh, this pandemic shows that um, the pandemics don't know borders and our response shouldn't either. Um, thank you, Dr. Davidson. Uh, Dr. Hauswald. I, I would like to reinforce what people have said about control. Um, the tribes are kind of unique in that they have real control over their own borders and over their own people. But what's interesting is it's not so much enforced externally. There just aren't many police on the reservation. and It's a very large area. On the other hand, tribal members have been extraordinarily compliant with public health measures. The tribe has gotten together with the state and with the national government. Um, the biggest complaint I've heard from from the Pueblos and the Navajo Nation and some of the Lakotas is that the federal government hasn't been responsive enough in helping them carry out this. When you have people who are willing to take into account the well being of the other people around them, a lot of these problems just simply go away. Even though the tribes are very poor, even though they're spread out over very large areas. When I drive across the res, everybody is being careful and everybody's trying to take care of their neighbors. So I really think that people are right. This is a matter of control, local control. But most of that control needs to be by moral suasion and by people trusting the experts. Thank you, Dr. Hauswald. Um, th th this question from one of our viewers, um, Mike, uh, uh, this is to you. How can um, we address, we've seen um, inability to access health care um, now, uh, minor, minor, people of minority groups have been turned away from accessing health care. Uh, how can we address that problem? Um, uh, uh, Keith, I can't see the question. So is it specifically about people being turned away from getting health care during COVID-19 or is it more, um, oh, it, oh, it is. Um, yes, from minority groups or minority groups that are being turned away from getting health care. Yeah. I think that um, here in the city of Flint, um, you know, I think at the beginning of my presentation, I did a really good job of outlining the highlights of things that are going terribly here. But one of the things that I didn't talk about that's going really well, and there are many things that are going well. One of them is that um, we have, uh, we're not making it one way. We're not relying on patients to come to the doctors with problems. We're actually reaching out. So this is not even contact tracing. This is one step further than that. This is, we have medical students calling on behalf of, behalf of doctor's offices, asking people, are you in your family okay? Are you having any symptoms? If you have any issues, don't necessarily take yourself out of your home, but call us back here right away. So I think that that's one of the ways that we are trying to make sure that the most underserved populations here in Flint 
get proactive attention and services. Great. Thank you, Dr. Smart. Uh, Dr. Lefeld, this question to you is from Louise. And Louise wanted to know if you could expand on the differences between COVID-19 and Katrina and what you're seeing uh, in New Orleans and, and in the region. Um, there are differences. Um, one is that um, it's very difficult to blame God um, for, um, for a natural disaster. Um, so while uh, there was a, a tremendous tragedy, there were um, ways to deal with that emotionally. Um, what we're currently seeing is that although people in during Katrina lost their homes, um, this is much different. Um, while people were able to flee, there's no way to, to flee here. Um, the social networks, while people were away, the social networks were sort of strong. So social distancing um, has really uh, put uh, a pressure on making sure we're socially coherent, we're socially strong, um, because culture uh, is such a big deal for us. Um, the difference is that um, COVID-19 is um, serving as a cumulative burden and one more risk on people who are already health disparate. And so it is not necessarily only that they're different, but it's on top of all the day-to-day -day health disparities there are. And if this is not convincing, I don't know what is. Yeah, no, no, quite true, quite true, Dr. Lickfield. Um, Dr. Davidson, um, uh, Jillian wanted to know, uh, well, it's a question from a few people. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation some of the innovative work that Johns Hopkins is doing to address some of the social determinants of health uh, in Baltimore. Can you, ex you gave a, a wonderful example. Can you share with us any other examples uh, either taking place or, or that are uh, aspired to for the future? Well, I think one of the exciting things that are, is happening is you know, public-private partnerships. Um, and also we have several, uh, I mentioned Henderson Hopkins School, which is, is a school that's run by our Department of Education. But there's many more um, seeding programs and mentorship programs. Uh, there's a, a program which is phenomenal. It's called the Merit Program, where it um, there's mentorship for students in the last three years of high school and through to college. So I think it's really about supporting and enabling communities, building upon strengths, and also recognizing that you know healthcare and the economy are linked. And um, so I think they're some of the things. And I think one of it's also been one of the things that I've reflected on. You know, Baltimore has fared pretty well in COVID nineteen relative to other cities. But I think, you know, when you look at, look at it, firstly, you know, we have a smaller population around 600,000, but also, you know, you have several, you know, two really robust health systems, you know, University of Maryland system and the Hopkins system, who are committed to the health and wellbeing of the community. Um, so I think there's multiple, multiple things that people are doing. But I think in the context of CUGH, um, each of our schools represent an amazing workforce to support and enable community activities and being role models for the community. Um, so I think just partnering with the community, listening to what they want and responding appropriately is what needs to happen. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davidson. And we'll have the last question to Dr. Hauswald, and then we're going to have each of the speakers are going to have some closing comments and emphasize some of the maybe additional points they'd like to make. Uh, Dr. Hauswald, uh, this is a question um, for you concerning the investments that are, uh, additional investments that are being made into the Navajo Nation and other First Nations in the United States. Uh, how do you see these investments and future investments being allocated to have the biggest impact on addressing the root causes of some of the uh, challenges that you articulated in your presentation? 
Well, I, I think I think to some degree the biggest challenge is not health care. I'm a I'm a clinician, so you know I'm always hesitant to say public health interventions are cheaper and more effective than clinical interventions, but they clearly are. Uh, improving the quality of the roads, improving the quality of the infrastructure would be really helpful. The tribes are gaining control over um, their own finances. And I think that's very important. I think that having local control with a democracy so that all tribe members can vote on where their resources go, not only empowers people, but also you get better results. People are smarter about where the resources should be put when those resources are local. So I think that's really the most important part of this. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Hausfeld. And so uh, final wrap up uh, before we close, uh, Dr. Hausfeld, uh, Dr. Davidson, Dr. Lickbelt, and finally, Dr. Smart, uh, please provide us with if you have a few wrap up points or, or points of focus that you'd like us to uh, to emphasize and hear from you. Dr. Hausfeld, over to you first. Uh, well, the wrap up, I, I think I've explained why the tribes are different and why the funding issues, particularly around healthcare, are quite different than for any other groups in the United States. But one of the things that's really come home to me um, with the COVID is what is really lacking is the ability to do adequate communication. I think when we get done with COVID, when this is gone, the biggest change in our healthcare system, frankly, is going to be telehealth. Uh, there's no reason for my patients to drive for two hours to come to a hospital for routine medical care in this situation. Uh, we can do outreach when there's adequate internet availability, adequate telephone availability. Um, I think in the future, far more quote, visits to a physician or to a nurse midwife are going to be done over the internet. They're going to be done through telehealth systems. I think that's going to be a radical change and a, frankly, a really positive um, outcome from this epidemic. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hausfeld. Uh, Dr. Davidson, please. Well, I really uh, like to echo those comments about um, some of the silver linings of COVID-19 and digitalization is one of them. I think if each and every one of us reflect on the presentations, it's hard not to feel some form of moral outrage. But unfortunately, that is not a strategy. And I think really what we need to do is, as a public health and um, global health community, is come together to think how can we be smarter in communicating to policymakers, how can we convey our these data, which to anyone just seems appalling, but how do we convert people to action? And so I've been doing a lot of thinking about how can I communicate more effectively? How can the organisations I'm part of really have a voice to see that these inequities and disparities um, are just not exacerbated? And sadly, because of the ec economy, I think that uh, maybe some of the worst is yet to come where there is less um, resources in the com community, less cohesion, more distress. And so I just think we've got to be ready for the pandemic of social and political unrest following the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Davidson. Um, please, Dr. Lickbelt. Um, thank you, and thanks. Very, very special thanks to the consortium um, for organizing this very important topic. Um, you know, in public health, um, and this is my almost my fourth decade in public health. Um, we say, on a good day, nothing happens. COVID nineteen brought us a bad day, so things are happening. Um, and the recognition of the importance of public health has um, has not been more important than um, than now. Um, and so, um, just as we build a home, um, the the most important part of that home is the foundation. The foundation of public health is where we, as a country, 
have invested the least in. We invested the least in having both a quant quantity-wise and quality-wise a health workforce, a public health workforce that can address pandemics, it can address disparities, it can address disasters. Um, we've in invested the least in the functioning of our healthcare systems, our hospital systems, um, the places where we provide care to our people. We've invested the least, and you've heard the coverage of internet and, and cell phones in our um, uh, First Nations in um, knowledge management. It is those pieces, those are the components of the foundation of our public health home um, that require and are screaming for an investment that are sustainable and that are scalable. Um, it is time to derive policies, not from our opinions, but from what science tells us. It is also time to invest in research that supports community academic partnerships so that we can address the questions that are important to the communities, not necessarily only nice to know. And lastly, it is also time for us, just like CUGH always does, is to look on the outside, to learn from the outside, because not always on the inside in our country do we have all the answers. Um, so this is an exciting opportunity to share that kind of information. And um, I'm glad CUGH is, uh, is uh, spearheading this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lechfeld. Um, and uh, for the fine, fine comments, uh, please, Dr. Smart. Uh, I, I, the one thing that we haven't talked about very much that I'd like to leave people with is that the educational disparities that already exist, those trajectories are about to get even more extreme after this is over. Think about it, kids are at home, lots is happening in a lot of households and there's a lot that's not happening in a lot of other households. Um, and I just want you to, uh, to kind of keep that in mind and understand that that will need addressing for anybody that don't, that's on that's in education. Um, the other thing is that root causes are just like root. They're hard to see, but we know they're there. The root causes are there, whether they're perceived only, or whether they're overt or whether they're self-inflicted, these concepts like supremacy, power, individualistic selfishness, corporate greed, all of them are there and contributing to what we see above ground. And I want to thank Keith, thank you, Dr. Martin, and thank you, CUGH, for doing this important work and having this webinar today. Thank you, Dr. Smart, very much. And on behalf of CUGH, I'd really like to thank uh, Dr. Hausfeld, Dean Davidson, uh, Dr. Lichtfeld, Dr. Smart, uh, for really uh, four fabulous presentations. I think we the gripping testimony here about infant mortality, lack of access to water, lack of access to education, uh, being confronted by an environmental pollutants and much more. Those fissures in U.S. society that Dr. Davidson spoke about, the root causes that Dr. Smart spoke about, the social capital that we need to invest in that Dr. Lickfield spoke about, and the challenges that not only the Navajo Nation but other First Nations face, but also the innovations that are taking place uh, across the country in communities that are disadvantaged. If we do not act in the face of the COVID-19 disaster and implement what we know can address these root causes, and we would be doing a terrible, terrible disservice and missing an extraordinary opportunity to ensure that every member of this country from coast to coast will be able to achieve their fullest potential and be able to access the opportunities they need in an equal and equitable fashion like any other person across this land regardless of whatever community they come from. And I just want to thank all of our speakers today for their wonderful presentations and Jenna Smith, who does a fabulous job of producing these webinars. And thank you very much for joining us today. This webinar will be on CUGH's website at www.cugh.org. Have a wonderful day, everybody. <laughs>